You're very welcome to family, Stephen. And uh, you brought the Christmas cheer with you, I can see, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah should I do that anyway? Um, Stephen Ray is widely regarded as one of the leading actors of his generation with a career that spans, what, over 40 years now, I think. Uh, in both theatre and film, in his film work, of course, he's worked closely with Neil Jordan, creative relationship which began with Angel in 1982 and saw him nominated for an Oscar for his performance in The Crying Game in 1992. As a stage actor, he played a key role in the formation and the development of the Field Day Theatre Company alongside Brian Friel and Seamus Heaney, whose busts adorn this building. A project which introduced a new sort of cultural politics, I think, into Ireland, and which of course has its 40th anniversary this year, and indeed Stephen's involved in a series of anniversary events to, uh, to re-explore some of the heritage, and the legacy of Field Day, but in the current situation and in plugging into current cultural and political resonances in Ireland. Stephen has been a recipient of many awards for his acting, most recently for his outstanding performance in David Ireland's play, Cypress Avenue, which I know a num number of people have seen in the audience. I've had the opportunity to work with Stephen on three film projects, employing his skills as a narrator and an actor. Like myself, Stephen was born in the North, and the core part of his work has focused on Northern stories and characters, and we both have with us that stigmata of having lived and worked in the North. Right, I'm going to start off, I really the interview will be in three, three parts, I'm going to start off exploring some of the issues of you know, how a filmmaker might work with a talented actor like Stephen, employing not necessarily in a classic dramatic film situation, but in a documentary format, employing the skills and the artifice that an actor of Stephen's Cowler can bring to a film. And you've seen this a wonderful uh, voiceover that he's done for Rahamore and Teal, Hard Road to Klondike. Then we're going to go on and talk about Field Day a little bit because that's a project that's close to his heart. And also it gets to the very core of one of the challenges I think that many actors face, which is what do you prefer to working in film? What do you prefer working in theatre? The immediacy of theatre, the family that theatre is, as opposed to the rather more industrial world of film um, and the rather more ordered world of film where the actor sometimes cannot be quite in the same centre of a community as is the case, I think, very often in the theatre. And then lastly, we're going to go on, if there's time, just to explore uh, the Cypress Avenue and the way that a whole series of very important plays and films have come out of really you know, the, the, trying to understand the Protestant loyalist mindset in the North. He and I both come from that background. He and I both struggled with this in different sort of ways. Um, and it's uh, it, interesting that this is, remains a dramatic richness, which may have taken on a new significance in the context of Brexit as new political horizons are opening up in Ireland and new questions, I think, are being asked of that community as they are being asked of all of us as we stare into what it is a very uncertain future. So just starting with the whole question of the role of the narrator within film, Stephen, you've had a close relationship with Donegal, and particularly with Northwest Donegal. I know you say you're not an expert on the storytelling tradition, but you have at various times, and I'm thinking really, for instance, in, this, in the Field Day performance when you played some Owen in uh, Brian Field's translation, Owen was the classic son of you, the hedge master uh, in traditional uh, Ireland of the 1830s. But Owen is a man also of the present and of the future. He's got himself a job as a trans translator with the Ordnance Survey who are mapping Ireland. He is bilingual, confidently bilingual by the stage, and he's a translator, he's a mediator between two different worlds, the world of the disappearing Gaelic culture and the Irish language, and the new world of the ordered uh, capitalist world, I guess you would call it, English world. Uh, Owen, that, that role of Owen seems to be some, some way symptomatic of the sort of relationship that we have when we look back to traditional Ireland, traditional storytelling. You know, and how do you feel that in that part you try to mediate it, you know, that those worlds, you know, in the two different languages and the two different mindsets really that were came together in translations? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think the thing about Owen is that um, he was using his skill of both languages and both cultures in a way to betray his original culture because the translation of the names from Irish into English was, uh, may have had some accuracy, but no, no feeling, no, you know, it's a transliteration of, uh, the, the names no longer 
had their weight, you know, and, and so the people were being robbed of, um, and this is what happened, you know, by being robbed of the language, they were being robbed of their history and their own description of the place where they were, you know. I think that's what Friel was trying to say, and it's, it's actually a very difficult role because in the end he reneges on what he's been doing and rejoins his own people. But I could never find the trajectory of that at that point, you know. Um, I mean, in the narrative of the play, uh, one of the young officers who is attached to the Ordnance Survey Unit disappears in circumstances which look like he may have been a victim of some sort of insurrectional activity. The famous Donnelly twins, never mm. seen on the stage, are up to some skullduggery. But this then leads to the possibility of reprisals from the British forces against the, uh, the Inishowen community. Um, and at that point then, Owen, trying to mediate all the time between these two worlds and these two communities and two yeah. languages, has to, sense has to make a choice. It's not really clear in the play what the choice is that he makes. It's left a bit dangling, isn't it? I think he's going to find the Donnelly twins to join them in their subversive activities. I think he is, you know. Um, actually, but uh, by the by, there's a very, very brilliant production of Translations on in London at the moment, and with Kieran Hines, who's worked with Field Day before, wonderful performance as um, Big Hugh, you know, and Judith Roddy and Amy Malloy, fantastic people there, you know, and it's a far, far about, I mean, the point about when we did it in 1980, it was still the height of the troubles. We were surrounded with, uh, you know, hunger strikes, bombs, British Army helicopters, and uh, so th th that context gave an immense power to the play, you know, and uh, but they've found a different power now in London in 2019. They found the real power of the play, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I come on a second to, to the field day, you know, and the location of the field day project within that particular historical milieu and what it means today. Just in terms of uh, narration, because actors do quite a lot of documentary narrations. Um, <coughs> And I always wonder what the, how they approach them. You know, an actor who's, who's been directed in a dramatic film, you know, is working through a part and working through rehearsals. Very often an actor who is involved in doing a narration, you know, may have a very distant relationship to the director or indeed to the project. They come in very often at the last minute. The director's probably already rehearsed the narration themselves. They've written it. Um, so, so it's something like the, you know, the Klondike film. How did you... When you read the script, how did you think, you know, what voice were you trying to find, really? You know, obviously, it's the voice of Mickey McGowan, but it's not, it's the voice of Stephen Ray, so where do you get the mediation? Just in the language. You only get, you only get anything in the language. That's the, 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 the only thing I was any good at at school, I mean, really, I mean, was reading aloud, you know. Um, and I knew that I was good because the teacher used to ask me more than once to read, you know, because <laughs> everybody else was really shite, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so it's, it's my great pleasure to read aloud, and it's my great pleasure to find the, 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 the rhythm of, of the lines, you know. And um, I mean, I hear documentary uh, narration and a lot of it's very heavy, you know. The idea is to try and um, allow people to hear it without without knowing that they're hearing it, you know. Yes, I, I was. We were talking, Stephen and myself, just before uh, this uh, session. I was confiding in him that when we recorded this uh, narration in a little studio in East Belfast, uh, whenever it was, nineteen ninety. Uh, I had an English producer, Sylvia Stevens, very good producer from Faction Films in London, but a, a, a producer concerned predominantly with television concerns and television constraints. And in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the recording, you know, when Stephen was in the booth and I was at the control desk with the, with the engineer listening to it, she said, he's, "You can't hear him. He's far too quiet. He's far too quiet. He's hardly, He's mumbling all the time." <laughs> And I said, no, that's exactly what we wanted him to do. <laughs> that's he has captured, you know, the soul of, of Mickey McGowan 
you know, and of course, uh, you obviously had chosen that as a strategy, and you were talking about, we were also talking about musicality in relationship to narration and speech. Uh, and you were saying, you know, in fact, you were invoking uh, Sam Beckett, who you've spoken to on this topic of, you know, the, the difference between meaning and rhythm yeah. in, in, in speech. Well, you know, I was lucky enough to work with Beckett, and I'm, I've probably bored the world enough about this, but um, I was in a production of Endgame that um, playing the role that Jack McGarren was supposed to play, but he unfortunately he was a great mentor of mine, Jack, and but he died, and they offered me the role, and um, I just remember like there are two major things that Beck had said to me. One was um, I asked him about the meaning of something, and he said, "Don't think about meaning, think about rhythm." Now that's what I I believe that should be something that all actors take take on board, you know, and um, he also said, when I asked him, that Clove, the character I was playing, constantly repeats, repeats the, the phrase, I leave you, I leave you. And uh, I, I said to him, when he says I leave you at this particular point, does that mean he's going to the kitchen or he's going for good? And Beckett said, it is always ambiguous, mm-hmm. right? So what, what, what that does for me is removes the whole ghastly, literal quality of actor's motivation. Uh, you know, but I can't go if I don't know why he's going. Well, half the time people live without knowing why they're living, you know? So um, I just found it opened up a whole new uh, possibility with with acting and uh, I, as Beckett's work has done for all of us, he's, he's, he's the great transformative moment of 20th century drama, isn't he? I mean, sensational writing and the attitude is uh, so informative. It's great, you know. Uh, rather more perverse mode of voiceover narration you got involved with in the, the 1988s. Just to begin a little bit of history lesson, 1988, the British um, authorities introduced a broadcasting ban, which ran from 1988 through to 1994, and meant that members of a number of prescribed organizations, including Sinn Féin, were not uh, able to be uh, recorded. Well, they could be recorded, but their voices could not be heard on British television. There was equivalent legislation operative also here in uh, south of the border. Um, that led to a little sort of curious little industry developing where actors then were asked to provide voiceovers um, for, uh, to, to, be, to, to be actually twinned with the non-heard performances of the, the various prescribed uh, political actors. Um, and uh, I believe that you, uh, you were paired with, with Jerry Adams during this particular period and you developed a, you know, a curious bifurcation relationship, really, in terms of no, voicing. No, no, I'll tell you what happened. Um, at this time, the whole censorship, it was, it was a noble enterprise, you know, because it, um, I, I, there's a, on some website it says, uh, I was hired to do Jerry Adams' voice. I wasn't hired. Mary Holland, the great journalist, uh, had interviewed Jerry, and uh, she came to me and said, we got this big interview with Jerry Adams, and uh, we're not allowed to use his actual voice. But we 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 we're going to try and get round the 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 ban by having him revoiced, and then so we will have everything he says in its entirety. He said because it's he says I believe there's a different noise coming from Sinn Fein. There's a a movement towards some kind of compromise. There's a movement towards some kind of, uh, perhaps, peace, you know? And she was a very, very noble person, uh, Mm -hmm. Mary Holland. And they were gonna put it out on dispatches. And would I, I was probably, I I knew her very well, and she asked me if I would do it. And and she said, and you know, we might get into trouble. So I said, well, I'll certainly do it then. (laughs) (laughs) And, and we did it, and I didn't imitate Adams. I just did it in my own voice, but I, and I left out his fluffs and his, 
um, bad breathing and everything, and made everything as clear as it possibly could be, so that the, if the world was listening, they would understand what was going on. And I, and I only did one. I did that one. And others then were hired after mm -hmm. me. And uh, I, I did that just as a, you know, a pact with Mary. And I'm quite proud of it, you know. Right. Just moving on to, you know, your career has spanned both theatre and film. And those are rather different sort of worlds, um, the lived world of film. Um, and the theatre, very different from the sort of industrial world, really, of, of film, particularly large budget films of the sort you worked on with uh, Neil Jordan, where you're dealing with, you know, a whole industrial division of labour where the actor sometimes can be swamped by the, by the, the production apparatus in many ways. How have you negotiated the relationship between those two different worlds? And what's your preference in terms of, uh, you know, the world of theatre as opposed to the world of, of film? Well, you see, I don't find the. Of course, the film world is industrial, but I don't feel that I uh, that I that I'm um, isolated within that. When when I'm when you're working in film, you're surrounded by a crew who you know very well, and you 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 get to love them, you know. And I love working with the cameraman and the the operator and. The sound people and everything, and you're trying to, you're you're all tr working towards the same end. You know, I don't feel exploited. I feel, uh, you know, and then if you're working with Neil, say, or a great director like Robert Altman, you're you're so caught up in the uh, in the genius of what they're doing, and so I find it a hugely collaborative thing and very and very exciting working on film, and I find theatre. Though I've, um, it's it's like a human sacrifice every night, you know, <laughs> and um, you you know you prepare yourself all day for the sacrifice, and <coughs> you, you cleanse yourself in the shower, and you get you go and you eat at the right moment because you daren't you daren't be digesting while whereas you know somebody will bring you a bacon sandwich on a film set, and, you go, and then you do the you do the scene, it's fine, you know, you don't, cause they don't have the same appalling nerves as you do when you're in a full theatre. Um, so they're both essential parts of the same thing, really, it seems to me, but I, I find film more relaxing. But I guess, you know, in terms of like the creative control that you have, and I speak now as a director and the director's craving constantly the control of what is quite a complex apparatus in a, you know, in a film shoot. You know, um, as an actor, do you not sort of feel that in, say, something like Field Day, and we're going to talk about the Pacific's Field Day in a second, it, it, it's a bigger sort of project that you can invest a lot in over a longer period of time. Um, you did invest a lot of it over a longer period of mm -hmm. time, and hence it's a creative community which speaks beyond that sort of routine of dealing with the daily sacrifice, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was a huge uh, enterprise uh, field day. I, you know, I mean, I loved theatre, and then when I did film, I realised, you know, I loved that too. But, um, um, theatre has a sort of immediacy, like when you do translations for the first time, you can feel that it's tangible, the impact on your audience, where well, you don't feel that with film until, because you're not there when they're watching it, you know. And um, so... Uh, on the other hand, you have a permanent record, and those, your work is preserved yeah. on, you know, on the celluloid, on the videotape, whatever it is. Yes, I mean, the, uh, w w last year, I think, they had a, um, a new print of uh, The Crying Game, and I hadn't seen it for 25 years, you know, because... But we, we all went to London and watched it, and I, I was able to watch it because I was detached from it, because it, it wasn't me on there anymore, you know. Uh, and I said to Neil, it's a masterpiece. I, I, when, when you're away from all the hullabaloo about um, 
the girl who has a penis, you know. Um, <clears throat> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> um, um, you, you just realize it's a beautifully, brilliantly told story because the, the thing as well is if you're working with Neil and people who've got great scripts, you, there's no question that in um, American films there's a manipulation going on of everything, you know, a manipulation of the script, a manipulation of the actors and, uh, you know, and um, but when you're working with Neil or Bob Altman or um, there's a, a higher enterprise, you know, and it's usually, it's in many ways the literary nature of the work, you know, because Neil's a great novelist too, you know. Mm. So, so you feel, you don't feel that sordid thing of mm. commerce, you know. Just going back to, to Field Day again, can you just recollect what the original motive was for forming the company and basing it as it was at that time? Uh, it, it still is in Derry. Well, I always wanted to... I've been working in England for a long time and, 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 and I was always working for somebody else, you know, I, uh, someone else's vision and intention. So I mean, I'd always wanted to start a company myself and I, I found myself in Belfast and a girl from Derry called Imelda Foley who worked for the Arts Council said, you know, we have some money if you want to do something. At that time in 1979, there was not so much going on because people weren't going out, you know, it was the tr tr height of the troubles. And um, so I, I'm, I, I immediately went, because uh, I'd worked with Brian Friel before, uh, a play called Freedom of the City. Um, and I, so I went to his place in Muff in Donegal and I asked him if he would write a play that we could put on. And he said, yes, sure, okay, write like that, you know. And um, he said, I'm working on a play at the moment about the place names being changed. And I thought, that's, that's perfect. And it, and it went from there. So I. You know, the beauty of it is that it wasn't all planned, it was just made the first step and suddenly, and then we were going to, we decided to do it in Derry where nobody did plays, much to the chagrin of Dublin and Belfast, the East Coast were going crazy because they'd lost one of their big breadwinners, Freel, you know, and Really, it was just literally like that. Am I driving you all mad? No. No, you're all mad. And so it was a series of happy accidents, you know. And and it was it was again. I use it, it was a noble enterprise, you know. It was something that we went somewhere where it was very hard to do theatre, and people were blown away by it. You know, and then the next year when we did Brian's translation of the Three Sisters by Chekhov, on the opening night, as you probably know, on the opening night, a British Army helicopter headed over, came on top of the Guildhall, and hovered there, and drowned out the dialogue. So I realised that art was important because they were trying to stop it, you know. <laughs> Indeed, many of the commentators and reviewers sensed very immediately that with Field Day, this wasn't just a theatre company or indeed even a theatrical project it was trying to bring a new theatre to, you know, to a place that hadn't had it before, but there was a cultural politics at the centre of the project as Friel understood it. Mm. What do you think those cultural politics were and what sense did they make in the context of what was, you and I will remember, was it virtually a civil war situation? Yeah, well it was a civil war situation and um, it was a situation in which all dialogue was, whatever language was being used was hackneyed and appalling and sectarian and bigoted and um, not all of it, but that, but at the, at the time, um, Freel said to me, um, 
it's all about language, you know. And I said, what, the play, translations, or theatre? No, he said, everything. Everything is about language, you know. So what that play did was, um, as indeed the work of Heaney and Seamus Dean, you know, Seamus Dean producing new ideas all the time, it just immediately stops that hackneyed, tired feeling that you've, mm. you've, you've heard it all before. And uh, it was, I mean, I realised when I saw the play in London, it's an absolutely sublime play because uh, it invites you to go somewhere different, you know. Um, and that idea of going somewhere different really became one of the, sort of the keystones you know, of Field Day that trying to deal with the, the political impasse and the descent into the sectarian rhetorics, let's, let's be honest about it, that was mm. taking place during that period, that somehow you could build within this sort of sanctified world of the theatre and its relationship to a new expanding audience, a sort of imaginative province of some sort that you know, would get you beyond the sort of here and now to some potentially imagined future, whether it be reconciliation you want to talk about or justice or whatever else, that it would get to, to a different place because it was very mired, you know, the society oh, in, completely. in Northern Ireland in that particular time. I mean, of course it was. I mean, and I, don't get me wrong, you had 50, 50, before the Troubles, you had 50 years of a one-party uh, police state, you know. Let's not uh, mince, mince words, words about it. And in a way, and this is not an excuse, when, the, when finally the troubles broke, it had an ine inevitability about it. It's the only way of getting rid of the very, very repulsive state that existed, you know. And, uh, but then that was as, the troubles were as bad as the, as the cause of the troubles. And so it needed the delicacy and you know, the beauty of some of the writing that we did, really. I mean, a lot of people took up Heaney's stuff, you know, hope and history rhyme, you know, and... Uh, um, you know... I mean, Freel talks pure about, you know, the, the challenges that the troubles represented for a generation of writers, I would say also filmmakers, dramatists, which was how you engage with it, but how you find a way of engaging with it, which didn't get caught up in the treacle of the here and now. You know, it actually some way of getting beyond it, a more generous way. He says, you know, I know a uh, new no Irish writer is not passionately engaged in our current problems, but we must maintain perspective uh, as, as a writer writing about the troubles that may not directly invo in invoke the here and now. You know, a kind of generosity he talks about, you know, that uh, embraces the whole island. You know, and that, who is this? This is Friel. You know, he, he, he's trying to say you always have to deal with it. Maybe you have to deal with the troubles in elliptical ways so that you can bring an audience in who don't initially put up the shield and all the defensive mechanisms, you know, which are part of it. Do you think Friel was able to do that to get to move the debate on, get some of the defensive mechanisms down, you know, and get beyond well, them? Well, I mean, it's, it, at first they were so surprised they didn't have the defence, but then, believe me, certain critical uh, assemblies in the east of the country, like, uh, where they were quick to get the defensive mechanism going. Well, about five years before they said, well, you know, old wine, old wine in new bottles. They're, um, uh, objecting to the Irish language being uh, spoken as being so native and important that it, that it mattered anymore, you know, and um, really quite shocking, you know, and, uh, and, and people like Brian and um, Seamus Heaney who had um, an international reputations and wanted, and, and you know, wanted to maintain them, were very, very delicate and careful about how they approached uh, talking about the North. But um, I understand that, you know, Heaney was very, very careful about the, 
the hunger strikes, and yet in his village in Balaki there was a hunger striker who died, you know, um, Francis Hughes, and he knew the family, and he, I shouldn't really, but he, he regretted not having uh, gone and visited the family. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, throughout this period, you were heavily invested in the field day because it, you weren't just acting as an actor, you were acting as a director on occasions. Um, you were involved in the production. Uh, you were running the theatre, all the funding of the theatre, all the difficulties of providing theatre and venues which weren't necessarily uh, provisioned for um, a contemporary theatre. Same time, you were developing your film career, you know, with uh, doing the work, the film is with Neil. How did you balance those things during that period? Well, you know, to, to be honest, uh, our first production was Translations, and second production was Three Sisters. And I asked someone else to direct Three Sisters, and I was going to play uh, the Oh God, the the mad guy. Um, um, uh, no, what's he called? You know, um, Tuzenbach. Um, I was going to play him, but then this woman wouldn't direct. It, didn't want to direct it. I think she didn't like the version, and so I directed it. And sorry, I'm taking too long to talk about this. Uh, and then somebody else played, but Nitin, Niall Buggy played Tuzenbach, and I. So that meant that instead of being um, engaged for three months doing the play, I was, engaged, I was actually doing it for about five weeks, and then I was free. And at which point, Neil Jordan was doing Angel, which was his first film and my first film. So, you know, uh, I was just lucky I was uh, available to do that. So that's how I managed to juggle brilliantly the two things together. <laughs> and, um, I w and it's a wonderful film, Angel, actually. He he's a wonderful filmmaker, and he hasn't made a better film. And, I mean, he's made great films. But the vision of Angel is as good as anything he's ever done, hmm. in my view. Just to sort of wrap the questions on Field Day, you're now preparing for this 40th anniversary of Field Day and you're envisaging a series of projects that will mark that anniversary. What do you think is this of contemporary relevance you know, of Field Day and the legacy of Field Day to, to where we are now, which is a completely different sort of Ireland, in some ways a much more favourable environment than you experienced when you started the, the company in 1980 in those years marked by, you know, hunger strikes and the rest. We're now in a world where everything seems, the, the tectonic plates, as people keep on saying, you know, are shifting in Ireland and we were, we we're confronting really quite uh, challenging but very exciting times in terms of how the island would realign itself, you know, as Britain slips out of the EU and Scotland perhaps slips out of the UK and uh, Northern Ireland is faced with you know, demographic change, you know, all of which are leading to putting once again on the agenda you know, the unity of the island, which you know, for so many years has, has been off realpolitik. Well, first of all, you see, when, when in 1980 and f during the 10 years that we were in operation really in the th terms of the theatre, we. Um, of course, we were obsessed with the issues that exist uh, in this country, and particularly in the north, and uh, and they are different now. I mean, look at um, I mean, look at the way um, Coveney and Varadkar are, were able to talk to the British authorities about uh, what Ireland needed in terms of Brexit, and because of having the backing of Europe. They had a stature and, uh, you know, a, a profound quality of uh, independence. You know, so finally Ireland uh, has genuinely become independent. And uh, that's very exciting to me, you know. Um, you know, Boris Johnson looked shabby and compared to, you know, the svelte dress of Radker, 
I got two V's into that sentence. <laughs> um, and um, I, I just think it is, it is different. But we have other big issues, and that's what I want to take up next year. Of course, there's. Um, I want to do a play uh, that uh, Louis de Puer has written, Diemer Rogers Grania. That's a musical piece, but um, I just want to put it on mm -hmm. and I invite Arlene Foster and make her watch it for endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, and we'll all sit there wearing crocodile masks, you know. <laughs> and, and, um, but we, ha we have a different world now, at least the world feels different to us now. We have a world that is coming into us. There's direct provision, there's uh, asylum seekers. We're now open, but we're not as open as we should be to that and to how those people are treated. There's no good pretending that they're going to go back somewhere. They're not going to go back because the world is changing. It's not, and the climate is changing. Everything is changing out there, and we have to... Um, you know, what we were saying in 1980, we had to change in regard to ourselves and, and the way we, uh, we, we, we operated in this country, within the environs of our own country. But now we're saying there's a, the world is coming and we have got to take on board the new situation that exists. And we have to have the decency to um, accept that these people have left appalling situations and they need help and they shouldn't be pushed away in a corner. But do you think that Field Day can have the sort of purchase that it had clearly in the, the 80s and the 90s? Do you think, you know, the theatre now can be the medium that can raise create the political forum and the imaginative forum, you know, that Ireland clearly does need a massive debate about where we go forward, particularly in relationship to the project of unification? Well, um, there's a momentum to reunification that is not um, in question anymore. Uh, it may stumble a bit, you know, but it's like uh, Scotland's independence. I don't believe that it's stoppable at this point. Uh, you know, the UK is breaking up. You know, the fact that they've, the action of leaving Europe rather than giving them a renewed independence. It actually sh shows that they're, they're um, retreating from the world. You know, they think they're going back to the old yeah. world that, where they were in charge, the pink bits on the map. Yeah. You know, it's not going to happen anymore. It's not. And, um, which is a good link into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is, there's a, like a million people in Ireland who still seem to represent, uh, you know, um, a voice that doesn't wish to be part of this narrative for all sorts of reasons. Now, you recently had the opportunity to, to work in David Ireland's play and to play the part of Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a man, um, you know, sort of going through a profound crisis, psychiatric crisis, but also reflected as an identity crisis. Do you think Ireland, David Ireland, captured what is this of the dilemma, you know, of that loyalist identity, you know, in this very extreme form that he presents, you know, a man going to pieces and wrecking terrible violence in his immediate family. Well, I, th I, thought, I thought it was one of the best plays I've ever read or been in. Uh, the, the great thing and interesting thing about David is that he, he came from a very, very loyalist background. His father was an active uh, loyalist paramilitary. Um, but David went to a school uh, in Belfast, um, in Stonians, in Inst, mm -hmm. yeah. And he was taught by inspired teachers. I mean, he obviously had a talent for literature and he was taught by a man called Frank Ormsby, who was a, um, a Catholic poet. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I just think, all the loyalist areas should be taught by Catholic poets, you know. <laughs> um, uh, no. um, and because he's a wonderful poet, and and he got everything. He said, he said to me, David gave or Frank gave me everything, you know, uh, Shakespeare, poetry, everything. And 
uh, and then he went to drama school in Glasgow and he was taught, uh, his mentor there was a man, Lord of mercy on him, Frank DC, who was a, a Dubliner, a wonderful, wonderful writer, uh, a Catholic from, and he was, he was, um, he, he got so much from him, you know. I mean, so he was, in some way, something in him was completed by this, you know, which, yeah. You know. And do you think that in your own background, you know, which is not the same as David's, but you know, has it's, certain- It's nothing at all yeah, like David's. Nor is mine, but do you think that you're able to bring that understanding of that psyche to the role uh, in a way that maybe Look, somebody- Look, you see, the thing is, <clears throat> it was like King Lear. It was like King Lear. He had the, the the point is that an awful lot of say loyalist people <coughs> who aren't well educated, I don't. Um, they didn't have the same grasp of theatre, so they just write a balaclava play, you mm. know, and it's tiresome beyond belief. And uh, but he r wrote a, a, in that case, and then any time he writes, uh, are plays of great size, and. Uh, huge ambition and uh, linguistically uh, absolutely uplifting hmm. um, and so he he gets to the real heart of the the size of the problem for 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 I mean it is like Lear if you read it you think you know he he kills his own daughter and he um, and he's utterly wrong, but he can't let it go. And, Absolutely. Uh, it, so it's a glorious thing and it doesn't, and then we did it, I know you need to stop now, but when we did it in New York and all these nice people that were watching it, they said, this is about America. <laughs> and they thought it was about Trump. <laughs> I mean, that's what, you know, they didn't that's think. That's the power of the play that it yes, translates. The yeah, yeah. They didn't think, oh, this is about Belfast. We don't know anything about that place. What's going on? They said, this is it. This is here. This is now. And a woman waited to speak to me afterwards. She said, I've never done this before, but this play is so extraordinary. This is what is happening in our world. This appalling swing to the right that uh, is appearing all over the place. And so it's... Um, he's, he's a truly magnificent writer, I believe. Yeah. Mm. At this point, I'm going to invite uh, Dave to join us. Uh, he has a few questions, Dave Flynn, a few questions. He's our cultural sponsor for this uh, occasion, and he has a few specific questions to ask Stephen about music and musicality, I think. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I work with him for years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, Neil said something very interesting, or you told me he, he had a very interesting quote that said uh, Stephen Ray is a musician who doesn't play an instrument. So yeah. I just wanted to ask you um, about music and how important it, it is for you in your work. Well, nothing's more important, really, you know, but, and I mean, I, but sure, everybody loves music. It's the f first thing. There is really. Uh, oh, and there's a, a wonderful voice teacher in London. I'll remember her name in a minute. But she, she said, you know, the reason why humans began to walk on their hind legs. I said, no. She said, so that we could sing. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I believe her. I do. That we had that something made us say, "I need to sing." You know, it's great, isn't it? So, <laughs> it's, it's fundamental to everything. And the reason you say about Neil Neil Martin, 
And it's because we, we do a, a version of book six of the Aeneid that, that Heaney was the last thing Heaney wrote. And, and we do it. You see, I was asked to read it at the Kilkenny Design Festival. Okay, Kilkenny, not the design, the Kilkenny Festival. Um, and I, I said, I'll do it if we can have Neil Martin playing the, the cello. And, and we did. And he got half the money. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give him an extra fee. They used to give him half of my money. And, um, and, uh, and it was just, we just started, you know. The first line is in tears as he speaks. Aeneid sets um, set sail. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just said, okay, I'll say, I'll start to say in, and you come in on tears. So just went, in tears as he speaks. And that's the way we went at it. And it was absolutely beautiful. And we would play off each other because the human voice is an instrument. There's no question about it. And those, I mean, before we get to the point where everybody's going to attack Heaney, you know, now that he's been dead a certain amount of time, you know, um, that version is out of this world, you know. It's so, it's magnificent. And every time you do it, it's like a present. And it's p partly like a present because he used a lot of South Derry words that are, that you wouldn't get in, uh, in most versions of a Greek or a Latin poem, you know. And it's, um, it's inspiring, you know. And can I just ask you, so in, in a theatre performance or, or something working with Neil, you're, you're obviously collaborating with a musician and you've, you can feed off each other. Yeah. Like, but when you're doing a film, you would never really see the composer or the sound, who's involved in the soundtrack at all, would you? And so, and you, you wouldn't necessarily know the music that's happening. No, you wouldn't. Film, so. No. Except in the Angel, you know, a lot of the music I'm, pl I'm miming to a saxophone um, with the great Keith Donald, who's a wonderful saxophone player. Um, I, I mime to his track, you know, but it, that music gave the character a great uh, depth, you know, and warmth and pain. And um, I just, I'll just tell, I mean, when, when we were filming it, um, you know, this is the thing about American, um, American films as opposed to our own, but uh, Robert De Niro had just done New York, New York, yeah? And they all said, he played the saxophone in it. And the same as when he did Raging Bull, they said he was such a good boxer, he could have beaten Sugar Ray Robinson himself. He couldn't have beaten my granny, you know? And, and, and then, and then I, I said, He's getting all these reviews, you know, he's as good as Coltrane, he's, you know. And, and uh, Keith said, I'll watch it. The, the next day he came in to rehearsal and he said, you've nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I felt inspired by Keith's playing in that. Sense. So that's a, one of the rare situations where you, uh, where you do have it when you're acting it. But there was a one, and in the crying game, I didn't, of course I didn't, but there was one, finally when I'm ordered to go, I've, I don't know if you've seen the film, but there's the, this black soldier that I've learned to love while I've been guarding him in the IRA unit. And, and then they say, you have to go and, now you have to go and shoot him. And, um, you just, you know, when you're doing a film, that's the, the you, you long that, um, that th that's a big moment that you hope, God, I hope I get this right. I hope they get me getting it right. But what happened was, it wasn't a big close up or anything. It's just, I turn and walk away and I'm going to kill him. And the music came in and it was the music that carried it, that, that, that created that moment or, lifted that moment. So when you were 
acting, like, there were nothing to them, you had no sense of what the music would be like at that point? Or no, I know I was just very grateful for it because I thought maybe it contributed something that I hadn't, mm. you know. That, that's, that's it's collaborative, you know, you know. Well, I'm conscious of the time. Um, we have another film to show. Is that Dan Stephen anymore? No, I don't. I'm listening intrigued to this conversation, but I think it'll go on, I hope, because it's a very rich sort of territory, this uh, mm. business of music and music and cinema and the role that music plays in, in dramatic expression. It really is a sort of... Um, I mean, I've taken great pleasure from using the music of contemporary composers. You know, I've always been recommending other filmmakers to do this, but it is very... The, the, the structures of arts funding do not assist this at all. You know, in other words, if you get money from RTE or Channel 4, you can't put in a budget for a composer. You know, you, you don't, I mean, you can try and, you know, work with recorded music effectively, but there should be within the arts councils a way to, 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 to foster this interdisciplinary creativity by bringing composers, actors, filmmakers, dramatists together in interesting ways to try and, you know, do something break the mould in various ways. Yeah, I agree. And just um, the film you're about to see now, Child of the Dead End, is a really interesting example of filmmaking because you didn't hire a composer. Um, you, you used music from Contemporary Music Centre of Ireland CDs and that's where you found my music and, and a lot of other composers. And it's, a, it's a kind of a unique way of presenting yeah, I used music from Deidre McKay, Dave Shelf. Flynn, Andrew Hamilton, Siobhan Cleary, all these people, all these brilliant young composers that we have, you know, John Gibson, Rachel Halstead, Kevin O'Connell, Judith Ring. I mean, these are people that the general population in Ireland doesn't get to hear. You know that as well as I do. And yet, I think one of the responsibilities of a filmmaker... Look, look I mean, I'm sounding too much in the public industry. I love the music. I get it to work with the images, and that's why it works for me. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and that's that's the only criteria that the filmmaker will ever have <laughs> in the use of music. You know that it, it gives it, it it delivers expressively within the piece, and that's what you're looking for. But it's been very important for me to do that. And, and Stephen, I'm interested because you you've been in Hollywood productions, obviously, and you also did work in Stephen's and the music or sorry, Dead Zone. And the music is obviously very different. Um, so when you saw Desus Willem where he's using contemporary Irish composers, like how, how does that music strike you um, in terms of eliminating the, the script? And well, you, you, you only look for one to illuminate the other, don't you? That's the, they work off each other. Um, I think so much in Hollywood is so heavy handed and it seems to have got worse, you know. There, uh, no, it's it's unbearable most of the time. I think, isn't it? I I, I don't know. I don't watch enough anymore. I must say. No, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it's time to stop. Uh, can I just thank Stephen Ray very much for his uh, thank you. Thank you contributions. We're